carry on with the presentation. Uh, this is about clean agent enclosure design uh, as it relates to peak pressure and hold times. Uh, we're going to be talking about the NFPA and the ISO that are the two main standards, the AS, the Australian standard, uh, and EN are pretty much the same. In fact, the standards are getting more and more similar all the time. So for those of you who have been in the industry for a number of years, uh, we go back to the early 80s. Uh, every system that was installed was discharge tested and uh, it was costly, uh, rather disruptive, not environmentally friendly, which is what nixed it in the end. Um, in 1984, 1985, I started to promote the idea of using door fans to determine whether or not an enclosure would pass the discharge test. And uh, when the EPA decided they wanted to prevent people from doing the discharge test because of the environmental damage it was causing due to the uh, uh, halons that were being released, the chlorobromal carbons that were being released in the atmosphere, uh, the Montreal Protocol uh, phased out uh, halons and the discharge test went with them. This presentation will be talking about both NFPA and ISO and this particular slide um, talks about various sections of the new uh, NFPA 2001 standard, the 2012 edition, section 5.6. Um, I've just put in, put in the, uh, a very brief description of what it says, but uh, in section 5.6 it says the concentration should be held for 10 minutes and section 7.7.2.3 says that uh, it will be determined using a door fan and in addition to that there's another section that says the enclosure should be inspected every 12 months. For those of you who aren't familiar with what a door fan is, there's a picture of it there, just basically a panel that fits into a door with a fan in it, hence door fan, and uh, a gauge that, uh, that makes the measurements. We both pressurize and depressurize the enclosure to find how leaky it is, and air leakage of the enclosure is the main thing that would determine what the hold time would be. Some of the improvements that have been made in the NFPA standard that uh, have transpired over a period of almost 10 years, um, I personally have put several thousand hours of research and labor into making the standard, uh, improving the standard, and there we see the old NFPA standard, which would be the 2006 version on back, and it shows where the same enclosure tested with the old standard would we would result in failures for both FM200, uh, Novak, and Argon, or any inert gas for that matter. Uh, whereas with the new standard, they would all pass, and a lot of that has to do with uh, a new test procedure that's been created, and uh, for descending interface, and also for continuous mixing that give longer retention times and uh, a better prediction of the peak pressure values. Now the um, ISO has very, very similar wording. It's uh, placed in different sections, but it also says the whole time shall be determined using the door fan, and uh, it talks about determining the agent retention or hold time at 85% of design at the 10 minute mark, and again they talk about repeating it annually. Uh, at this stage, as mentioned earlier, the two standards are very, very close. There are some differences that we'll talk about later. Uh, and I guess we're at later already. Um, one of the things is that uh, the ISO standard requires the calculation of what's called HE and HE is the equivalent height, which is a way of, um, I guess, faking a, a, what's called a white interface and giving some credence to the fact that when the agent uh, 
leaves the enclosure and interface forms. Um, we found in our research that the uh, interface that's mauled in this fashion is very, very conservative and often gives a hold time that's only 60% uh, or 75% of what it would be uh, in reality. So it does add a high degree of conservatism that we found was unnecessary. And in the past five years or so, I've got the ISO committee to accept uh, a change in the interface uh, formula, which makes it a little bit less conservative. And when the next edition of that comes out, that new interface formula will be in there, and it will be less conservative than it is now. The other requirement that's in there is that um, protection be maintained to 90% of the enclosure height, which um, in the eyes of many is entirely too conservative and forces the enclosure to be unsealed and I think in a lot of cases unnecessarily and uh, forces the use of pressure relief vents in every case, which doesn't necessarily add much to the overall uh, protection of the enclosure. Um, there are other reasons why this extra conservatism is not really helping much because there's what's called a leakage split method and people often rely on the leakage split method uh, incorrectly to show a much longer hold time than is actually there. So on one hand they've added a very high degree of conservatism, on the other hand they have inadvertently um, opened the way for testing which is not really representative of what's going on. So it tends to be what happens when we try to be too conservative. So there are two things that happen when, a, uh, as far as the enclosure is concerned. Uh, one is that there's a peak pressure spike that occurs uh, during the discharge and then there's a, a hold time period that's usually 10 minutes. So we'll talk about the peak pressure first. So as far as uh, peak pressure theory is concerned, um, I think I have a slide here which shows that um, we have an inert gas here being discharged and you'll notice that it has a positive pressure spike that occurs for usually around about 10 seconds or so and it falls off exponentially. The reason for that <clears throat> is that when the valve opens on an inert system, uh, we get the maximum flow rate uh, virtually instantaneously and then it starts to drop off as the pressure in the tank starts to drop off. So that causes the uh, pressure spike. There is uh, a slight cooling. Uh, this is unfortunately in, in Fahrenheit, but I'm sure you can translate into, into centigrade. We see here IG55 in inert that has a temperature drop over, let's say, 60 seconds of around 13 degrees Fahrenheit. So what's that, about 7 degrees Celsius. Uh, so there's a little bit of cooling that goes on in the room, but not all that much. Uh, if we take a look at FM200 or NOVAC, which are two of the most common uh, halocarbons, you can see that not only is there more cooling, but uh, more than twice as much cooling, but the cooling happens in a very, very short period of time. In roughly about seven seconds or so, we have the maximum pressure drop. What that means is when we look at the uh, peak pressure curve is that we have a, an incredible drop in pressure inside the room due to the contraction of the air in the enclosure because it's being cooled very, very rapidly. That cooling is also a function of the humidity in the room. The less humid it is, the more cooling there is, the more the negative spike is. Each one of the halocarbons has a slightly different characteristic curve. Uh, this particular one looks like Novak. Sometimes FM200 can look similar, um, but they all go negative and then they go positive. The positive spike is primarily due to the nitrogen blowdown in the tank, so it's kind of like we have a little mini uh, 
uh, inert agent discharge followed by the halocarbon discharge, which is where the liquid is flashing to a gas at the nozzle causing massive cooling. And once most of the liquid is gone, which is after around about 10 seconds or so, then we have the nitrogen blowdown, and that's where we get the uh, positive pressure spike, as you can see over here. So this is uh, another agent, HFC-125. Uh, again, it shows a similar shape. Uh, this particular agent characteristically has a, a similar negative and positive spike, as you can see. But again, it's uh, humidity dependent. There's also a temperature dependence in the room. And most of the, or all of the formulas are based on uh, discharges into uh, room temperatures of around 20 degrees C, 68 degrees Fahrenheit, or thereabouts. Um, the main uh, determinant of the pressure that's formed in the enclosure is what we call the leak to volume ratio. And as the enclosure gets tighter, we get more and more pressure. Uh, if we were to double the size of the enclosure and double the leak to volume ratio, we get exactly the same pressure spike. So what we've determined is the easiest way to um, characterize leakage, or I should say peak pressure and leakage, the relationship between the two, is to look at the leak to volume ratio. Now, different standards may look at mass flow rate and so on. Um, and interestingly enough, mass flow rate is kind of assumed that if we have a certain uh, concentration in the room, it will require that mass flow rate to achieve that concentration. Um, regardless of what you're using as your criteria, the leak to volume ratio is the prime determinant. Um, as I've mentioned already, the, uh, the humidity is one, of the, uh, is one of the big factors. And uh, as far as leak to volume ratio is concerned, the only way we can really control it is to uh, put in pressure vents. And there's a, uh, I guess, a characteristic curve for the humidity effect, and you'll notice that on the red curve, which is the one sloping down, when the humidity is lowest, the uh, humidity correction factor is the greatest. As the humidity approaches 100%, the negative spike will virtually disappear, because at that point, the, the air is saturated in the room, and there's not much uh, cooling due to uh, flashing at that point. There is a very small effect on the positive pressure, um, but it's more a matter of uh, it appears to have a greater positive spike simply because we didn't go as far negative and we have to recover from the negative spike. So by going negative, we actually pull the room into the negative state, which tends to decrease the positive spike. In most cases, the negative spike tends to be the largest one, but it depends on the agent and it depends on the humidity. So as a result, we need to look at the humidity range whenever we're looking at a discharge of a halocarbon. So as far as uh, peak pressure design is concerned, um, there are several requirements. One is to specify the enclosure strength, which we'll get into a little bit later. And the peak pressure estimate must be made, which will be based on agent type, the type of valve that's used. Um, there's only one example that I know of where the valve has been characterized, and that's for pro-inert, which is uh, an inert agent that has roughly half the peak pressure um, of other, uh, other inert agents, 
because its valve regulates the flow rate. The discharge rate, uh, typically we're running 10 seconds for halocarbons and 60 seconds for inerts, but if those discharge rates are to increase, it will change the amount of peak pressure. In the case of halocarbons, when the discharge rate goes down, you would think that the peak pressure would go up, but in fact that doesn't occur to the extent that you think it would because we simply get more cooling. Uh, that's somewhat offset by the fact we have more mass flow, so it's not a straightforward relationship as most of the previous equations that predicted peak pressure thought. So when we're looking at NFPA, uh, there are some new sections in there that are required, and the 2012 version is a major rewrite of the enclosure integrity portion. It's the first major rewrite since I think 1980 something or other when it first came out. Uh, it first came out as a HALON standard NFPA 12A, <clears throat> uh, which was in 1986, I believe, that that was uh, first went into use. Um, and really there has been minor changes in the meantime. Of course, we've added a whole series of inert agents and other halocarbons as well. But the basic procedure for testing and so on hasn't really changed too much and the requirements haven't changed. Um, in 2012, uh, a major rewrite of the section now requires an, em an estimate of the maximum peak pressure that will occur, which requires a calculation in the design phase that not too many people are doing at the current time, but uh, it's something that is required and certainly will make life a lot easier when it comes to actually testing the enclosure. Uh, the last thing you want to find out when you're testing an enclosure prior to acceptance is that you have to chop a hole in the wall to put in the vent. All these things can be predicted ahead of time. The next thing we have to uh, come up with is what's called the specified pressure limit, uh, how much pressure can the walls take, and that's also something new. And Appendix D1 says that enclosures must be capable of withstanding peak pressures that will be produced at discharge. Both standards say pretty much the same thing, ISO and FBA, when it comes to peak pressure and the requirement for doing an evaluation of it. Uh, you can see here in the ISO section 7.4.1 that it says that the enclosures have sufficient strength to contain the agent discharge. So we are essentially running into pretty much the same requirements for peak pressure for both NFPA and ISO. They're very, very close in terms of their requirements. So some of you may be aware um, we were involved in a um, five or six year research project that looked at all the helicarbons or all the most commonly used helicarbons and all the inerts to determine what the peak pressure uh, contribution of each of them was. Prior to that, there'd been a, a little bit of research done on inerts in terms of peak pressure, and the manufacturers had all come up with their own equations. Um, but we did find that the equations, since they were conducted in an area of interest that was not close to the 10-minute retention time, which is basically around the an LVR of around uh, what five or seven or so, uh, which is a pretty tight enclosure, which would be like a 30-minute retention time. <clears throat> that that really wasn't um, an area of interest. Uh, the real area of interest was in this area here. Let's see on the next slide, I think it shows that which is, this is, uh, I believe, I believe this line is a 10-minute retention time. This is a 20-minute retention time. But you'll notice in this area, there's a 200 or even a 300. No, it says a 10-minute hold time. Now here we've got a 200% difference between the research data and one of the manufacturer's curves. And in fact, some of them are extremely optimistic. And there can be much as a 400% difference. What that means is, <clears throat> 
that the peak pressure formula is in use at the area of interest, which is around the 10 minute retention time, are optimistic by as much as four times. So if they think that 250 pascals will be created, actually it's going to be closer to 1,000 pascals is going to be created in the enclosure. The reason why there is, again, there is such a difference is that the research project that we did uh, measured the peak pressure over a very, very wide range of leak to volume ratios that straddled the 10 minute retention time uh, which is really our point of interest because we are going to tighten up these enclosures so we get at least a 10 minute retention time and that's where we want our formulas to work. So that's the reason why there's that big a discrepancy. The other thing that we discovered that the halocarbons in some cases can produce almost the same peak pressure as an inert when the enclosure is again tightened down to the point where it gets at least a 10 minute retention time. As I will show you later, if we were to discharge an inert and a halocarbon in exactly the same enclosure, then the halocarbon would only produce about a quarter or a tenth of the peak pressure. However, the enclosures for halocarbons must be twice as tight, or sometimes three times as tight, and that becomes an equalizer. So when the enclosures are tightened down to a 10 minute retention time, we find that the peak pressures start to be similar between halocarbons and inerts, which is the big surprise and the reason why the existing standards now require a peak pressure evaluation for all clean agents, halocarbons included. The software that we have that we call um, Fantastic Integrity will calculate the pure V size that's required and soon we'll have what's called a designer's version on the web that will allow you to look at the enclosure from the design standpoint. Um, currently the software is designed to test the enclosure uh, after it's been constructed to see whether or not it would develop excessive peak pressure. At that point, obviously, the die is cast and, you know, it's hopefully it passes, but if it doesn't, you're in trouble. The designer's version will allow you to more easily uh, look at the enclosure backwards and, uh, and determine, uh, you know, whether it's been designed properly for a peak pressure and hold time. And the bulk of the presentation will be uh, involved in looking at the different factors that will affect that. This still can be used as an excellent uh, design tool and in the leakage area portion of this right in the middle there you see where it says leakage area it says tested or enter untested. We can then uh, put in untested values which can be just random numbers that we can put in there to find out the relationship between hold time and peak pressure. So whenever we put in an enclosure leakage area, we will get a peak pressure and a hold time, and we can see how the two of them interrelate. On one of the previous slides, I believe I showed, see if I can back up here. Hopefully I'm backing up to the right slide. Uh, here we go. So here we've done a, uh, an evaluation of hold time and peak pressure, and we can see the relationship between the two. And as you change this leakage area, if that leakage area was reduced, then the hold time would go up, and the, uh, the hold time would increase, and so would the peak pressure. So increasing the hold time is a good thing, increasing the peak pressure can be a bad thing. So um, we tend to have a window with any enclosure. We have a window that um, on, on one side means it's okay for hold time. On the other side, it's okay for peak pressure. And if the two of those overlap, then we have to have a pressure relief vent in order to accommodate the difference. 
Okay, let's just go back to where we were here. So what we've discovered with the halocarbons is that we have to have a pressure relief vent in some cases if it's required and that pressure, pressure relief vent has to open in both directions. So typically or all the time the inert uh, um, peak pressure is a positive pressure so the vent has obviously got to allow pressure to be relieved, positive pressure to be relieved. In the halocarbons case we may have a larger negative spike than positive so we have to relieve it in the negative direction and then also allow the vent to relieve it in the positive direction so there's a new class of vents out there that are called dual acting pressure relief vents that will allow pressure to be relieved in both directions. This is a new system that we've developed that will allow us to test PRVs uh, over 500 pascals, um, which is, I believe, 10 pounds per square foot, uh, to see whether or not the vents actually open, and when they do open, how much relief vent area they actually have. This is a, a special fan system. Um, it's not just a matter of taking two fans and connecting them together. This configuration, they're contra-rotating, meaning the blades are running in opposite directions. That allows us to get up to 500 pascals and still get over 4,000 cubic feet per minute, which is around 7,000 cubic meters per hour, and still measure the flow accurately that would enable us to test the vents in a test enclosure that in some cases can simply be a large cardboard box, which uh, we can often just tape the PRV in there and see at what pressure it actually opens. This is an important consideration because often when we get pressure relief vents, they don't open when they're supposed to. In some cases, they're not calibrated properly or they're jammed or whatever. So people who have had pressure relief vent failures will actually check all their vents. Uh, it's kind of like checking to see if your gun's loaded before you clean it. Uh, it's a very wise thing to do. So now we're going to uh, focus on uh, hold time. Uh, I know Stephen hasn't sent me any Skype saying there's any particular questions that people are interested in, but uh, there's a steady stream of questions coming in from people, and he looks like he's doing a great job at, uh, at answering them. Uh, I'll run over them at the end of this, and in some cases, uh, we actually publish the questions and answers that people have uh, posed to us. So now let's talk about hold time. So um, obviously, the first um, event is the peak pressure event or the discharge event and that's going to be from 10 to 60 seconds. The whole time event, uh, the whole time period is usually around about 10 minutes and we won't get into the reasons for the whole time but we'll just talk about what it is and how to measure it. So the primary force that is driving agent out of the enclosure is gravity. <clears throat> All the agents are heavier than air except nitrogen, which is lighter than air. And in fact, in the case of nitrogen, we've debunked the idea that because it's lighter than air, it ascends out the top of the enclosure. In fact, does not do that. Um, we have for a long time assumed that uh, nitrogen doesn't ascend or descend, which we've been able to prove experimentally uh, what happens when nitrogen is first discharged because there's cooling like we showed you earlier it actually makes the nitrogen uh, heavier than the surrounding air which makes it fall out the bottom of the enclosure it then goes through a neutral stage where it doesn't go anywhere and then it starts to ascend out of the enclosure at the end what it amounts to is that it doesn't seem to have much of a preference for going out the holes at the top or the bottom so we've assumed that nitrogen is always in what's called a continuum mixing state and gravity is not the driving force. For every other agent, gravity is, and it's the thing that creates a density difference across the leaks. As the agent flows out, air flows in, and there's some kind of interface that's created between air and water. 
Uh, a good example of an interface, an obvious interface, is if you have a coffee cup, you've got air above the interface, which is the surface of the water, and water below. If we punch a hole in the bottom, the coffee flows out of the cup, the interface falls, and it's very, very narrow or clearly defined, or you could say it's a sharp interface. Uh, NFPA assumes it's a sharp interface. Um, ISO assumes it's what's called a wide interface. And the truth of it kind of falls somewhere in between. Um, the halocarbons are closer to being a sharp interface. The inerts are closer to being a wide interface. But in fact, the actual performance difference between ISO and FBA is somewhere in between the two of them. There is a dynamic discharge pressure which doesn't actually change the whole time much at all. It's all taken into, into the agent retention equations. And in fact, we normally get quite a bit more, you know, quite a bit higher agent concentration than we're supposed to because the concentration formulas um, pretty much allow for the maximum loss that you would have during discharge unless you just happen to have one of your nozzles pointing into the adjacent enclosure, which I've seen, and the agent's actually not being discharged in the enclosure at all. There can also be static pressures involved, and sometimes uh, enclosures are pressurized, sometimes intentionally so. Even during the agent retention time, that will affect the agent retention and is taken into account in the retention time formulas. There's also a stack effect, which uh, can come and go, and it can be a factor. And leaky dampers, meaning leaky HVAC dampers, which is really an uh, unintentional um, HVAC uh, you know, source of agent removal, shall we say. And then there's wind. Uh, I've had several proposals in for wind losses. I haven't seemed to be able to get them to be accepted. However, in cases where um, the agent is exposed to wind on all sides, the wind can actually be the major driving force. And uh, we have wind loss formulas that we've created, but we've not been able to get them into the standards. So this is the uh, NFPA sharp interface. Uh, as time goes on, we show air above and agent below, a very, very simple transition. With the wide descending interface, as the agent runs out, the concentration goes from, let's say this 10% agent over here, it goes from 0% to 10%. And then as the agent drops out of the enclosure, the interface eventually uh, hits the floor, I guess. But uh, the interface gets wider and wider and wider. In fact, we've discovered this doesn't actually happen. The interface goes to a characteristic thickness, which is about a quarter of a meter for halocarbons to about a meter for inert agents, and then stays there. Uh, in fact, sometimes the interface can actually get thinner uh, as it drops, so our assumptions there were incorrect. And the new equations that will be um, finding their way into the ISO standard and have been accepted by the committee um, we'll identify this, and instead of the wide interface, we call it the thick interface. So, uh, I don't know, Stephen, if you've got any questions there that uh, uh, that are that I think I should direct to the rest of the audience here, you might want to just kind of open up your mic and chime in at this point. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Mark is just asking about um, if you have a comparison for constant pressure inert systems. I think uh, you'd be best suited to answer. I'm not sure what he means by constant, like a pro inert. Uh, perhaps he's just asking for a comparison of constant pressure inert systems. Uh, perhaps the question isn't clear enough for Mark. Yeah, I don't. Uh, is this question written up in one of the question logs there? Yeah, it is. Yeah, I can't see it there. Yeah, um, I'm not sure what he means by constant pressure. Uh, I mean, it may be a term that uh, 
uh, that people are familiar with. I'm not. Um, it could be the um, uh, constant flow valve that Pro Inert uses, and I think some other manufacturers have valves that allow agent to be released at a constant flow rate, which is, I guess, could be termed constant pressure. Um, it could be an extended discharge where there's a constant pressure at the nozzle over a period of time, but I don't know the term well enough to be able to answer it just based on that small amount of information. Okay, so we're going to carry on. Uh, if you can give me the complete picture on that, we'd be happy to try and answer that for everybody. So, the uh, this section here is uh, nine options uh, that we're going to discuss that would enable us to pass both peak pressure and hold time. Now, there's a difference in philosophy between, say, the American and the European. What a surprise. Uh, in terms of enclosure design, um, in the U.S., they haven't really bothered a heck of a lot with pressure relief vents, and they mostly just relied upon accidental leaks. And in some cases, they haven't even done uh, door fan tests to see how much the enclosure leaks. That is um, fraught with danger because there could be a peak pressure event that would occur if you don't measure the um, enclosure leakage. Um, in Europe, they tend to make the enclosure as tight as they possibly can and then rely on pressure relief vents to relieve that pressure. The problem with that kind of falls on the other side of the fence that they're increasing the potential for peak pressure in their enclosures and relying completely on pressure relief vents. So if that vent happens to fail, uh, and there are many, many modes of pressure relief vent failure, then they can run into problems in that uh, regard as well. Um, the reason why I mentioned that is that the damage caused by a peak pressure, catastrophic peak pressure event, can often be worse than the um, smoke or fire event that the uh, system is trying to put out in the first place, which could be relatively minor. Um, there are often false alarms and so on. So you don't want to create more risk to the hazard uh, due to peak pressure than you had in the first place. So uh, I, I think there's something to be learned from both philosophies, but I believe that it's possible to design an enclosure that is intrinsically uh, safe uh, or intrinsically has a long hold time and has very little danger of uh, peak pressure uh, damage because of its intrinsic design. So we're going to take a look at those. So here are all nine. Um, now there are two, um, I guess, two ways of looking at hold time. One is the descending interface model. The other is a continuous mixing model. And the, the first one, uh, increasing volume and flooding above the ceiling uh, and lowering the protected height for descending interface are mostly descending interface related. The third one is uh, continual mixing, uh, which is very important to understand that continual mixing can occur. So number one is to increase the volume flood above the ceiling. The U.S. never does this. Europe always does this. I think Europe is right here. The more agent you have in the room, the better protection you have. Um, it enables us to uh, have a leakier enclosure, which allows for pressure relief venting and also gives us a long retention time. Uh, by the time the agent falls down to the equipment, enough time has gone by to meet the whole time requirement. However, I think that in the ISO standard, if you go by the letter of it, uh, taking 90% of the enclosure height, which in this case would be well, well above the equipment height, uh, kind of defeats the purpose. Um, I see no reason why we should be um, maintaining concentration at 90% of the enclosure height. Uh, in some cases, this has been modified. In the case of Australia, they've modified the ISO standard so that um, the protection 
only has to be, I think, half a meter above the protected equipment. So in that way, you get credit for putting more agent in the enclosure, which makes a lot of sense to me. So I think we all have something to learn from that. Um, and here's uh, the suggestion of decreasing the minimum protected height of the equipment. Uh, the lower we get the equipment, the better it is for the sending interface model. In cases where we want to protect right up to the ceiling, we cannot use the descending interface model. We have to use the continual mixing model. And it must be specified, it's extremely important to understand at the, in the design phase that we are going to require continuous mixing. And that will be whenever we're trying to protect at the very top of the enclosure, we must have a higher concentration than the normal design concentration. So if your normal design is seven, we have to up that to say 9%. Um, because if our design concentration is 7%, we have to hold 85% of seven, which is around 6.2 or something. Uh, and for continuous mixing, our criteria is the drop from 7% to 6.2%, which is gonna happen very quickly. If our initial concentration is at 9%, we're dropping from nine to 6.2%. And that will be roughly four or five times longer retention time. So for continuous mixing, the higher concentration we have in the room, the longer the whole time will be. And this is typically done by leaving the HVAC, the dedicated HVAC system in the enclosure running during the whole time. In rare cases, there may be some kind of mixing going on. And almost all cases, continuous mixing will occur just due to the small ventilation fans that are inside units or even due to thermal effects, we can have continuous mixing when we don't uh, want it or even know it's going to be there. And it seems like most of the designers are completely oblivious to the fact that the continuous mixing will be occurring in many, many cases, particularly with inerts. Inerts are continuously mixed very easily with a small amount of thermal or, um, say, equipment cooling fan operation. Uh, we can get continuous mixing pretty much throughout the enclosure. So uh, we really need to know more about this. And how no I know about this is by testing enclosures with smoke and finding out what the mixing patterns are in the enclosure. And you know, we can find um, continuous mixing in probably half of the enclosures that are out there. Most of them are assumed to be descending interface, in fact, aren't. Now, the next thing is to uh, consider at least increasing the uh, pressure limit that has to be specified. And it seems to be that an engineer will say, oh my god, let's uh, specify some really, really small value to make sure that uh, I'm not liable and so on. Well, that's kind of good and bad. Um, what that, what that means is that you probably have to install oversized pressure relief vents to keep uh, that enclosure pressure down. You then could run into a lot of expense in trying to get the enclosure tight enough to pass the whole time requirement. So it's not necessarily, um, I guess, the road to um, success. What we discovered, um, testing a lot of these enclosures that they can actually contain a lot more pressure than we think. In fact, if we go back to the pressure relief formulas, since they're, some of them are out by 400%, we're already uh, regularly exposing in, enclosures to 1,000 pascals or 20 pounds per square foot without even knowing it. Uh, in some cases, we think we're only going to be uh, achieving 250 pascals, we're actually achieving 1,000 or so, uh, very commonly because the pressure relief formulas that we have, I believe, are incorrect. I say that because I have personally witnessed uh, the thousands of data points that we've taken over a very wide range of enclosure leakage and seen that the formulas that we have now uh, accurately predict peak pressure. And I know for a fact that if people have been using the existing peak pressure formulas, these enclosures are being pressurized much, much higher levels than we think they are. Um, 
So a quick review here is uh, the rule of thumbs that I use is that uh, a typical 2 by 4 wall that uh, has sheet rock on both sides that uh, is supported at the ceiling in some way will handle about 250 pascals, which is roughly about 5 pounds per square foot. Once we go to 2 by 6, that goes up to 500 pascals. 2 by 8 goes up to 750 pascals. And pretty much any concrete block wall that's reinforced can handle 1,000 pascals. Now, I say reinforced because a concrete block wall that's not reinforced can actually uh, topple over, in some cases, easier than even a 2 by 4 wall for the simple reason that uh, when it gets hit with a pressure pulse, it can crack and it doesn't move. Um, also, when we have a flexible wall, if that wall moves a quarter of an inch, it will drastically reduce the amount of pressure that's created in the room due to that pressure spike. So even a quarter of an inch movement in the wall will decrease the peak pressure that room experiences by as much as 50%. That's why concrete block walls are um, more at risk than, say, more flexible uh, 2 by 4 metal stud or wood stud walls. So that's the first thing is to, is to be realistic about the enclosure strength. Uh, I know 250 pascals is a, a common uh, peak pressure that is specified, and I think that any reasonably built wall will handle 500. The moment we go to 500 pascals, it really takes a lot of the pressure off, uh, so to speak, of the pressure defense. Next is to compare agents. Uh, we can run all the agents in our software in the design phase, and you'll see here that when we're looking at helicarbons, that uh, they require much, much tighter enclosures to get the same retention time, in this case 15 square inches uh, versus 40, uh, almost three times the amount of leakage that, uh, uh, that the inerts can tolerate. And, uh, and the peak pressure values you can see are a little bit smaller for the helicarbons, but not a lot. And if this humidity was to be lower, they could be up at the same level as the inerts. Uh, the next is to consider the extended discharge, which is very, very common with CO2. It uh, tends to be more expensive, not commonly seen with inerts uh, other than CO2 and helicarbons, but it is uh, something that should be considered in the design phase particularly if we have a very, very high minimum protected height or a hazard that needs to be protected at a high elevation and cannot be protected with mixing. So um, the other is to, particularly for small enclosures, to consider a reduction in the hold time, which uh, in both standards, both NFPA and ISO, uh, it's not fixed at 10 minutes. Uh, NFPA talks about or a time for response by trained personnel, um, and ISO says something fairly similar. Now, that also could mean, on the other hand, that the retention time could be 30 minutes, which changes everything. Uh, if we have a remote site and it's going to take 30 minutes for uh, personnel to arrive on the scene after the fire event, then that retention time must be longer. So 10 minutes is a default, but it's not always the case and must be considered in the design phase because, again, it can change everything. Now, number eight is um, one that I use uh, commonly whenever I look at an enclosure, usually helicarbon protected enclosure. No one's thought about putting vents in. And when we do the enclosure integrity test, we go, whoops, we've got uh, 2,000 pascals of peak pressure. What are we going to do with that? Uh, no facility to start hacking holes in the wall and putting in vents. Um, what we can do, though, is we can get a free pressure relief vent simply by changing the timing sequence on the HVAC isolation dampers. So what I would have recommended there in the past is instead of closing all the dampers and then discharging, that we discharge and then start the closing of the dampers um, at the point of the discharge where peak pressure is no longer an issue. Uh, we need to check this to see how much leakage the room has through the HVAC system to see whether it will be sufficient. But 
you know, this is, has, you know, saved a lot of installations that I've done in the past. Um, and the last one is to reduce the lower leaks. Um, what this amounts to is um, we come to an enclosure, it's relatively leaky, typically we start air sealing. If we start air sealing on the bottom of the enclosure, we can get a good hold time because that's where the agent's going to leak out. If we leave the leaks on the upper part of the enclosure, we can allow for venting. And in this way, we can actually have an enclosure that will pass both. There are very few enclosures that will not pass both the hold time and the um, peak pressure requirements by sealing them in this way. So the designers may say, oh my god, well, we don't know how much leakage is going to be in the enclosure. That's true, but we can, um, in some cases, even install a passive vent above the suspended ceiling, for example, that gives us leakage above the ceiling that's a continual, let's say, a continuous uh, pressure relief vent there um, that will still enable us to um, to maintain concentration and reduce peak pressure. So let's just take a look at this and see what this looks like. So in this case here, we have um, we have FM200, Novak, and Inert, uh, uh, a 40% inert agent. All of them have a peak pressure of over 250 pascals. Let's say 250 pascals was our peak pressure limit. Okay. So this is the total um, leakage of the room, as I've shown you earlier. Uh, what we've done over here on the yellow side is we've tightened the room down to the, you know, so the lower leak is um, relatively small. So we've still got a total leakage that's fairly large, in this case double what it is here, in this case roughly double what it is here. But it's the leakage distribution that's different. So here we've been able to get the peak pressure down to a very, very low value, maintain retention time, and the only thing that we've done is to determine the uh, leak, or it's called the leakage split. Now, commonly, uh, when people use the ISO standard, they incorrectly use what's called the leakage split method that allows you to attribute 15% of the leaks to the lower part of the enclosure to see if it passes or not. But they leave out the step of actually measuring how much leakage is there. So um, it's relatively easy to do. And one way to do it is to cover the ceiling in plastic and to remeasure the leakage to find out how much leakage is in the lower part of the room. The problem with this is it's very time consuming and if you happen to fail and you want to get to the above ceiling space and do a bit of sealing up there, then it's difficult to do. Although primarily your air sealing will be below the suspended ceiling. So uh, the other disadvantage is that any leaks through that plastic will show up as lower leaks so that it means you have to do a perfect taping job, which is possible, but I've done about four or five of them in my lifetime, and they take anywhere from four to eight hours to do, uh, whereas I can do a flex duct test, which is depicted here on the left. I can do this in 20 minutes, just with me alone. Um, a new gauge that we have out now has what's called zero pressure neutralization, and uh, it enables uh, one person, one technician to do this test and to neutralize the pressure across the suspended ceiling as we've shown here with the this fan with a flex duct connected to the above ceiling space its sole purpose is to neutralize the pressure above the suspended ceiling at that point the lower fan is going to be measuring only the below ceiling leakage area and that's how we differentiate between upper and lower leaks there are other ways of doing it as well. The ISO standard suggests, uh, you know, covering up uh, upper leaks and remeasuring cover lower leaks and remeasuring. This actually is that procedure. Um, the wording doesn't really define it specifically, whereas the NFPA standard defines the BCLA or flux duct test as a specific test and gives exact um, instructions. But at the last um, Last meeting of the ISO committee, um, I brought this up as encouraging this technique 
because it's a legitimate measurement technique as opposed to what's doing right, what's happening right now in a lot of cases where people just say, well, the lower leaks are 15% and I'm not going to bother measuring them. So they can be measured. This is the way to measure them. And uh, this is another graphic that shows essentially the same thing. This is one of our older systems um, running leak split test. We have a special system that does this. Um, it's obviously more expensive. It's essentially like buying two separate systems. The advantage being that you can operate them as two separate leakage systems and you combine them to do this test. And the only extra piece that you need is the flex duct, which allows us to connect to the above ceiling space. Obviously, this doesn't work if there is no suspended ceiling, but just about all the computer rooms I've run across have suspended ceilings, and uh, this works just fine. Uh, a derivation of this test is the uh, subfloor only uh, test, which essentially neutralizes the pressure across a walked on floor. And this is quite a common test. We have an entire chapter in our manual about that as well. So we're, we're running a bit over time here. Um, hopefully everybody can, can bear with us. Uh, we will be putting this presentation onto our website for those of you who have to leave. Um, but uh, we'll carry on. So I'm going to talk about uh, five good design tips. Sorry, I just had to get my hat because the uh, sun just coming up and one of the buildings is reflecting sunlight <laughs> into my eyeballs. Uh, so uh, th there are five, really, that are really, really important, and, and most of them um, are around venting. Um, and it must be understood at this point that there's a relationship between venting and hold time and the... Uh, I guess influence of one or the other kind of shifts back and forth, but they all relate to leakage in the enclosure and how we understand it, how we typify it, how we measure it. So the, the first point here I have is that pressure relief vents must open early. Uh, if your pressure relief vent uh, opens at 500 pascals and your enclosure is designed to take 500 pascals, it will overshoot way past 500 pascals. The um, pressure relief vent uh, rating that we've decided on is that is to relate is to rate uh, the pressure relief vent at 125 pascals. So we measure its open area at 125 pascals, and uh, if you're going to go up to 250, that's fine. Uh, it's going to open early enough. Um, at 500 pascals, I guess you could make a case for you should be rating it at 250, but it starts to get difficult to rate vents up that high. Um, but I think it's really important if you're installing a gravity vent to A, measure the point, at, the pressure at which it opens fully, and B, to measure the leakage area of the entire pressure relief vent path which, the, like the vent itself, may have half a square meter, but there may be another restriction along in the ductwork or from an adjacent room or whatever that means that the actual venting is much less than that. So that's very important to both have your vent open early and have the vent area that you anticipate. So number two is to vent as high as possible. This does two things. Uh, one is that as the... Uh, even as the agent is being discharged, the air does tend to boy up to the top of the enclosure. So uh, when the vents are high, you tend to vent air, not agent. And the other advantage is that during the hold time, we don't lose much agent out of the upper leaks. So when our vents are high, um, it solves that problem. We do have to concern ourselves with if there's a suspended ceiling in there, They'll usually take only about 50 pascals before they get blown out, maybe 100, maybe 
150 or so, so we do have to have venting in our tile so we don't blow out the suspended ceiling. The third is, uh, which I mentioned already, that we really have to measure the vent, the actual vent area of the vents that we're using. So the best way to do this is to pressurize the enclosure with your door fan, watch to see that the vent opens, and actually measure the amount of vent area that you have. This tip was given to me by a company that had three pressure relief vent failures, not in a row, but for different reasons. And they say, now we turn on the door fan. If that vent doesn't open, we know we're in trouble. So it's a very simple way of determining whether you have a safe situation or not. So the, the, the problems that we see that checking our events with uh, the door fan will, will show up is um, that the vent opens partially or opens up too late. Uh, in some cases, it can be blocked, which is the reason why the vents should be checked on an annual basis to make sure that the venting that we saw last year was still there. Um, these flaps can be obstructed. They can be blocked. They can be um, uh, distorted and, and jammed and so on. So we really have to make sure that there's nothing blocking the, uh, the venting. Um, if we have electronic dampers, they must also be checked on a regular basis to make sure that they open. Um, in one case, they had an underground facility and they were worrying about hold time. And I said, don't worry about hold time, but if those dampers don't open, you're going to blow the roof off this building because there's no leakage in here whatsoever. So it's extremely important that those dampers um, be checked on a regular basis. Um, I do have a bit of a preference for gravity-operated dampers simply because they don't rely on um, fancy electronics to make sure they work, um, but they all need to be checked. And the other one is that sometimes, amazingly, the pressure relief vents are installed in the wrong direction, both for inert, sometimes um, like they might think there's a negative pressure required or they might just be accidentally installed backwards. Uh, if it's a halocarbon, they may be venting on the positive side where, positive, where their negative spike is the one that is really going to hurt them. So we do have to check that also. Uh, so this is a point about uh, venting suspended ceilings to make sure that they're open. I have a funny little formula there that I use to determine whether or not I'm going to lose my ceiling or not. This looks like that happened to this individual. Um, I guess no one thought that that would happen. There's two ways that we can lose the suspended ceiling. One is by the pressure that's formed across the suspended ceiling, where the suspended ceiling doesn't leak enough to allow venting to the holes that are above it. Um, the next way is that the velocity of the nozzles can actually blow the tiles out. And this one looks like a pressure event that's pushed the ceiling up as opposed to the tiles being blown out due to velocity pressure. But either way, it needs to be considered. So Retrotech has an enclosure integrity training and support. We've uh, supported over 3,000 testers worldwide for about 25 years now. And um, that's a major part of our business. Um, I like to think that we are the world leaders in this area. Um, I believe that probably over, probably over 95, maybe 99% of all enclosure integrity tests are used with our equipment, used with our software, and so on. Um, I personally have been involved in this since the day one. I was the one who proposed door fan testing for enclosures back in 1984 and have written most of the texts and most of the standards on the enclosure integrity and peak pressure sections and so on. So there's not much I don't know about it. Um, always new things to learn, I guess. Um, three levels of our training. The first one is for HJs, FPEs, fire protection engineers, um, which we require everyone to take that. The second one is for uh, the tester. The third one, we call it the advanced tester. <clears throat> and uh, I think it's really worthwhile to take the third level, um, mostly because um, there are a lot of things that can make your life a lot easier that can be resolved by using the flex deck tests and some of the more advanced testing techniques that are in the third level. So 
we try to make it price advantageous for everybody to um, take the third level. I, I believe the upgrade package for the fire testers in the U.S., we made the third level pretty much the same price as the second level, just so that we would encourage that. The next thing that we have is uh, all new software, or we call it Fantastic Integrity. Um, I guess I could bring it up on my other screen and show you how it works. Um, we are getting a little bit short of time here, but um, we have now integrated peak pressure and hold time in the same software package, and uh, it allows you to create files in XML, and if you ever have a tech support question, you simply send us the XML file, and we see everything you've done. We see every reading you've taken, um, the timing of all the readings. It can be also exported to Excel if you want. It has a uh, very sophisticated reporting feature that reports in Word and enables you to put uh, into the template all of your company logos and information. And we have a standardized report format that you can use. You can customize that for yourself. So every time you click report, it basically generates a report in a few seconds as opposed to probably three or four hours is what we typically use to write up a report. So this should cut several hours off that time. Um, we, you can download a demo version of it from our website and operate it. Um, and I suggest you do that. So this is the end of the webinar. I just thought I'd uh, check in with Stephen to see if he's got any other, other questions there that uh, I might be able to answer. Um, See that uh, Giuseppe's asked a question about the main difference between NFP and ISO related to room integrity test. Um, I, I've discussed that already. The equations are pretty much identical. The difference is that ISO has um, a wide interface simulation that's dictated by HE. In our software, you can run exactly the same data through both of them. Uh, you probably get a 25% longer retention time with uh, NFPA than you will with ISO. And ISO, as I mentioned earlier, uh, suggests that you uh, maintain concentration up to 90% of the enclosure height. Uh, I know in the UK they have um, fought against this and don't think it's reasonable. Uh, it unnecessarily increases the cost of air sealing the enclosure and forces you into relying on pressure relief vents. So that would be the main, the main difference. Uh, I think that um, someone was asking a question about comparing our door fan equipment to other manufacturers. Um, door fans were originally designed to test houses and we have a house testing system that's our Model 1000 which is relatively inexpensive. Um, they're all pretty competitive. All the, all the main manufacturers have a system that tests houses and we call them house testing pens and they will work for enclosure integrity testing up to a certain extent. Um, most of the people that do enclosure integrity testing use our high power fans for um, one really big reason, that is that they can test at higher pressures, which are is where we want to be testing the pressure relief vents at. Um, and they tend to be more stable. So um, it's not so much a matter of using one door fan or another. Um, it's kind of like a Ford or Chevy, I don't know, Peugeot, Renault, Mercedes. They all get you from A to B. Uh, there's no, you know, once you get from A to B, it doesn't really matter how you got there. So all of these pieces of equipment do one thing. They measure the enclosure leakage, which is actually fairly trivial. It's kind of like a ruler. It's a whole measuring device, et cetera. Um, the, the real question is, what do you do now, you know? Um, what do you do with that number? How do you analyze that number? How do you compare the window between peak pressure and um, hold time? And um, the analysis of what you do with that is really a significant part. And I think that's where um, I think 
that's where RetroTech has an edge. We have several thousand pages of manuals that we've written over the years, and I know that we've put in probably 10,000 hours into writing our documentation, and no one else has put that effort into their documentation. No one else has got the research background that we have on it. Um, so it's not just simply a matter of uh, taking a door fan that you can buy pretty much anywhere and even just running an Excel spreadsheet or whatever on the enclosure formulas. It's, it's a matter of kind of making sense of it all and understanding the relationships between, as, uh, as I said before, hold time and peak pressure. And that's something that's taken me a lifetime to learn over 25 years of experience. So that's essentially what we offer is that experience. Uh, I consult directly with all major manufacturers, uh, both of agents, whether it be 3M, uh, Novak, uh, Bukita Fenwell, Chemitron, Fike, um, Tyco. Um, all those companies consult with me on a regular basis. If they have an enclosure integrity problem, I'm the guy that they talk to. Uh, if, they have a, uh, if an authority has a question about um, whether you should be doing it this way or that, I'm the guy that people ask um, because no one else has really dedicated their life to this that I have. So essentially that's the product that we offer is our experience and, uh, and know-how and how to make sense of it all.